Okay, uh, welcome to Wednesday's lecture. Um, we finished off yesterday talking about capacitance. Uh, we talked about voltage uh, initially yesterday, and then we talked about um, kind of the work done and how that relates to voltage Q delta V um, and how you can use Q delta V inside of the conservation of energy equation because it is the electrical work done in the same way that mu Fn uh, is, well, mu Fn times D is the uh, work done due to friction. You can have Q delta V to be the work done due to an electric force. And then we moved on into talking about capacitors and uh, how they're useful because they can store charge. Um, they can act like a mini battery. And uh, then we, a natural question is, what makes a capacitor able to hold charge? Why does one capacitor hold more charge over another capacitor? And we defined capacitance and that allows us to sort of predict and explain and quantify how much charge um, a capacitor can hold as a function of its attributes, similar to a bucket and the volume of the bucket being how much water it can hold. And um, we, we didn't have enough time yesterday to go through some examples, um, maybe, maybe for the better actually, because it gave you some time to sort of percolate um, so now, before we jump into the next section, I just want to spend maybe 10, 10 minutes or so um, doing some, just one or two problems uh, in dealing with capacitors, and then hopefully that kind of puts things into context before we move on. So the first thing I want to do with you uh, is this question here. It says, a parallel plate capacitor has uh, fixed charges, positive Q and negative Q. So I'm a physicist and I, I hate words, so let's just draw kind of a diagram here. So we have positive Q on one plate and negative Q, oh boy, negative Q on the other plate. That's what the first sentence says. And, the separ uh, and then the separation distance is halved. So I suppose this is saying that at initially the separation distance is D. And then we will, we will make these plates closer together by a factor of two. We will get them uh, closer by a factor of two. Question A, by what factor does the energy stored in the, uh, in the electric field change? So we learned yesterday that the energy stored in a capacitor is E cap equals, and if you forget, I can scroll up briefly. There are three different versions. So there's one half QV, one half CV squared and one half Q squared over C. So you use whichever ones uh, you know. So here, uh, I'm just gonna write down the first one. One half, uh, I should use capital Q because that's what the question used, Q, V. So we ask ourselves, okay, do we have Q? Yes, it's given in the, in the question. Do we have V? No, we don't really have V. Well, what do we know? Well, they're talking about the separation distance D. How can we encompass D into one of our two variables? Now, we're given Q, so that sort of tells me, using my problem solving skills, that sort of tells me V is the problem. We kind of have to swap V out for something else. Now, I'm thinking that the distance between the plates obviously has to come into things. So what equations do I know? What theory do I know that involves the distance between two plates in a parallel plate capacitor? And the only equation that really exists is that the capacitance uh, is equal to epsilon naught A over D. And this is helpful because capacitance C is one of the rearrangements of my energy equation. So that tells me we have to sort of rearrange this equation to swap out V in terms of C because C is dependent on D. So I use the equation Q equals CV. That's what we call the capacitor equation. It relates um, how much charge is in the capacitor or on the plates of the capacitor um, to how much voltage is applied across the plates. And uh, swapping out V, we see that um, V 
is equal to Q over C. So when we plug this in, we're going to get one half Q squared over C. And although we're not directly given anything about C, we are given some idea of, of D. So that tells me we should swap out C for the definition of the capacitance. So we should swap out C. So Q squared is going to stay by itself. But instead of writing C as C, I'm going to write C as, oh, come on, epsilon naught A over D. So if, the, if it's over D in the denominator, then it, it comes up in the numerator. So there we have it. And um, what we're doing here is we are simply comparing the values of things that we have and what we need and what are variable and what are constant. So the question asks, by what factor does the energy stored in the capacitor change um, if the plate separation is halved. So now that we have our equation, we see that it's a function of Q, separation D, and plate area A. Q is not changing. <clears throat> the area of the plates are not changing. The only variable that's changing here is D. If we were to reduce D by a factor of two, you see in this equation that if D goes down by two, then E capacitance goes down by a factor of two. So the answer to part A would be that the energy in the capacitor would then decrease by a factor of two. Um, so B, we're, the, the, that's a simple answer for A. Um, I hate for that to be anticlimactic, but that's A. B, how much work must be done to reduce the plate separation from D to D over two? Well, simply the amount of, for B, the amount of work that's done, you would use conservation of energy. You look at E total, oops, E total before has to equal E total after. So we say, well, how much, how much energy did the system have before? Well, it had one half Q squared D over epsilon naught A. That's how much energy it had before. After, it has one half Q squared D over two, epsilon naught A. Now, obviously those two things don't equate, right? One is literally half the amount of the other one. So conservation of energy says that energy must have gone somewhere. Well, that energy goes to work done. So I'll say plus however much work was done in the system. So we've got one contribution on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, um, the amount of energy gets divvied up between two sources. One source is the, the amount of energy left in the capacitor after the work has been done. Um, and then the other contribution is just an arbitrary amount of work done. That work done could be used for anything. It could be used to power a light bulb. It could be, you know, it, it could have gone into our muscles for us to like push the plates closer together. Um, you know, that, that is energy that is lost out of the capacitor and is now free to do whatever work we, we want to do with that electrical energy. So you'll see here that when you solve for W, W is in fact going to equal the original amount of energy subtracted the new amount of energy, and that is simply one quarter Q squared D over epsilon naught A. Okay, so that's a, a fairly simple sort of example question, but it kind of shows you how to use Q equals CV. Uh, it shows you how to use the energy in a capacitance equation, how you can use Q equals CV to sort of rearrange that as you need it. 
Um, and part B also demonstrates kind of how you would incorporate, um, you know, previous concepts from 136, i.e. conservation of energy, uh, with these sort of new, new ideas as well. Uh, of course, nothing substitutes doing homework questions on your own. Um, it's really hard for me to do more challenging and more involved problems in lecture because they're just longer and lectures are only two hours. And for me to do a sort of more involved question would take half an hour, 40 minutes to explain thoroughly. So um, unfortunately, tutorials, yeah, absolutely. The tutorials, we, we can do that. But lecture, unfortunately, we do not have the luxury of the time to do that. But um, you know, this is what I'm encouraging you to do either in tutorials and or um, as practice problems in your homework. And then you can reach out to your TA or myself um, if you're running into any sort of uh, conceptual issues. The second question I want to do with you before we move on is um, this one. It takes 18 joules of energy to move, so the energy required is 18 joules, to move a 0 0.3 millicoulomb charge. Millicoulomb is times 10 to the minus 3, just like a millimeter. Centimeters times 10 to the minus 2, millimeters times 10 to the minus 3, millicoulomb, same thing, times 10 to the minus 3. I'll actually just write that down so people can see that. Um, from one plate of a capacitance of 15 microfarad. A farad is the unit for capacitance. Uh, if you, again, if you look at the equation for capacitance, um, um, epsilon naught a over d. Um, each of those variables has its own va uh, has its own units. A has meter squared. D has meters. Epsilon naught has its own units. So clearly, all of those units blended together is going to give something messy. Um, we have just called this. We have just called this farad after Michael Faraday, which is fit well most notably known for Faraday's law, one of Maxwell's equations, which we'll get to later in the class. But um, Farad is named after Michael Faraday in the same way that a Newton is actually a kilogram meter per second squared. But we don't call it a kilogram meter per second squared. We call it a Newton after Sir Isaac Newton. So um, we're doing the same thing with capacitance. So 15 uh, microfarads is, is actually going to be 15 times 10 to the minus 6 farads. Um, how much charge is on each plate? Okay, that's kind of part B. So here it says it takes 18 joules. Uh, it takes 18 joules of energy to move that charge from one plate to the other plate. Part A says, um, oh no, just how much, oh, there is no part B. How much charge is on each plate? Okay, so we need to relate energy Q like the Q of the um, uh, object being moved, um, the Q of the plates and the capacitance of the plates. So uh, the way you do this is you, uh, first you always draw a picture. So we have, we have plates. And what you have is you have some charged particle that is being moved. Is it a positive amount of work? It's a positive amount of work. So I suppose we're having to push it. So I, I suppose um, it's being pushed against, not that that math is technicality, I was just trying to be technically correct. I, I don't actually care how students draw the diagram on their page. Um, so we're, we're pushing this positive charge Q against an E field. So how much work does it take to do that? Well, the amount of work it takes to do that is Q delta V. That's how much work it takes to do that. Now, the other thing we know is we know something about um, the capacitance of the actual capacitor, and we're asked something about the charge uh, on the plates. So we kind of have to incorporate all of those things as well. So you see here, we have work done, right? Work done is 18 joules. We have Q, it's um, 0.3 millicoulomb. But we don't have delta V. We don't have the, the, the charge, or sorry, the, the voltage difference across the plates. So is there a way for us to figure out what the voltage difference across the plates are? 
using um, all of all of what we know here. So the answer is well, it has to be yes because that's what we're what we're doing. The question is how. So we have some equations at our disposal. We have the energy in a capacitor equation. We have one half q v. Um, we have q. Oops. Q equals CV at our disposal. Um, we have the capacitance equation, epsilon naught A over D. And we have the electric field in a parallel plate capacitor, delta V over D, which also equals um, Q over epsilon naught A. So those, I, I think, is, is sort of the, the encompassing equations of what we've talked about the last few days. And we sort of have to figure out, you know, um, how do we swap out, how do we find Q on the plates given everything else? Um, so if you look here, um, you can actually find delta V by finding um, the energy, oops, well, the work done, which is the energy divided by little Q. So this is actually going to be 18 joules divided by little Q. So we can actually solve for the voltage uh, between the plates using that equation. And given, given that we're, we're given capacitance, we need Q. So if you look here, this is going to be equal to the delta V. So if you look here, we have delta V. Um, we have C, and we're looking. So we, we don't have C. Oh, yeah, we have C, and we're looking for Q. So those are the three, uh, the three sort of uh, variables that we, we kind of have and need. And out of my list of equations that we have here, um, it, it looks like this one is the one that's gonna do the trick. So here I would say, oh, come on, Q is equal to the capacitance times delta V is gonna be the energy divided by Q, which in this case is gonna be, what was C? C was 0 0.3 times 10 to the minus three times energy. Energy was uh, 18 joules divided by Q. What was Q? Let me just scroll here. Oh, uh, no, capa I, I wrote the wrong one. Capacitance was 15, sorry. This was 15. Capacitance was 15 times 10 to the minus six farads. And I divide by Q. Q is 0 0.3 times 10 to the minus three coulombs. And there you go. You would, uh, you would just plug everything in. Um, I don't have a calculator, so let me just kind of refresh your memory of how you might uh, go about simplifying some things if you don't have a calculator. So what simplifications can I do here? 15, uh, 18 divided by 3 is 6. So 15 times 6 times 10 to the minus 6 plus 4. Um, 15 times 6 is what, uh, 30, nope, uh, 30 times 3, so, well, 30 times 3 times 10 to the minus, uh, 2, is that true? 30 times 3, yep, so this is going to be 90 times 10 to the minus 2, which is going to be 0 0.9. Um, coulombs. Okay, I hope I did that right. That's just mental math. Um, if that's wrong, I'm going to look at the uh, the chat briefly because that might be wrong. Okay, well, I'll let Romina answer that question. Anyway, um, yeah, if you had a calculator, that wouldn't be an issue. You could verify your answer. So anyway, um, hopefully demonstrating that sort of logical thought process uh, uh, helps when you're doing your own problems. Uh, I understand this is, you know, every chapter we do is going to be a new chapter. So, um, you know, hopefully I'm modeling for you kind of uh, good steps for you to take when you're, when you're trying problems that you aren't immediately aware of how to solve. Um, and, and, you know, part of that might be at first listing all the equations in that chapter so you have them visible to your eyes to see and you can kind of um, write down what variables you have, what variables you need, and it, it's almost just like a matching game at first. And I, I know that's not physics, and I know that's not science, but that at least gets your foot in the door. And once you become more comfortable with these sort of um, these new ideas, um, after persistent studying and persistent question asking, 
um, hopefully that, that helps you kind of grow and become more solid in the actual material. But everyone needs a place to start. So hopefully approaching sort of new problems in this fashion gives you a, a solid place to start. Uh, okay, moving on. The next chapter we're scheduled to do is talking about current. Um, we, the first sort of chunk we've talked about in this class is what we call electrostatics. So I'm gonna write that down now. The first sort of head honcho chunk was electro, was called electrostatics. And electrostatics is largely governed by Gauss's law. So all of electrostatics is governed by pretty much one head honcho equation. Yes, there are other things like the capacitance and the you know, Q, Q delta V. Yeah, those are all sort of um, building upon pre-established notions, but um, electrostatics is largely governed by, by Gauss's law. So now when we talk about electric currents, really, this is talking about Current means movement. That's like ocean currents or river currents or water currents. It means movement, and we call that dynamics. So we finished with electrostatics, and now we're moving on to electrodynamics. Um, so that's, that's kind of the story we're telling ourselves. So that's what this first slide says here. It's the difference between where we used to be just previously, electrostatics, and where we're about to be, electrodynamics. Statics, literally the English word statics means stationary or things in terms of physics, equilibrium means F net is equal to zero. Dynamic means motion, means things are changing. It means there's a non-zero acceleration. So let's think, we know in English what the word current means, uh, it kind of means movement or water current means there's water that's moving. In this context, in the context of this class, what does it mean uh, to talk about current. And when I say that, I, I implicitly mean electrical current. I won't always say electrical current because it's kind of redundant in, the, in this context, but that's what current means. Well, as is true with water, to have water current doesn't just mean you have water. It means you have water that is moving. So that's how we measure electrical current as well. We have electrical charges, Q, and they are defined to be moving when they are literally moving. They're, the, the rate of change of current, uh, sorry, the rate of change of charge with respect to time is non-zero. These charges are physically moving. Now, this is not a calculus-based physics course. So, it, I mean, it doesn't mean we can't talk about the calculus to, to help enrich our learning, but in the context of 137, um, even though this is the mathematical definition of current, it's dq by dt, um, 99, well, I'll say 95% of the time, we're going to be talking about current as the, the change in, because it's not a derivative, the change in um, charges over the change in time. And the way you can think about this is how many charges pass through a, uh, a point divided by the time it takes, or the, the, time you, the, the time you measure. Are you, are you counting four charges in 10 seconds, or are you counting a million charges in 10 seconds that are moving? Obviously, if you have a million charges in 10 seconds, that is a much larger current or a much larger volume of charge that is moving than four charges uh, in 10 seconds. So that's how you can think of current. It is literally the number of charges that are moving past a certain threshold uh, per unit of time. Now, these are all very abstract. I've said this before. Um, I'm gonna try very hard throughout this entire semester to sort of make these ideas more concrete for you and relating them to things that you, can, that you have experienced in your life. You can picture current, like the charges moving in a wire, like vehicles, cars, trucks on the road. So if you have three lanes of traffic and say a thousand cars, it might look something a lot like this. But if you have six lanes of traffic and still a thousand cars, you're gonna get something that looks like this. 
the amount of current is the same because in both of my examples here, in both the left picture and the right picture, I'm claiming, I'm making up this number, but I'm claiming you have something like a thousand cars. And they're moving forward uh, in the same duration of time, both in, in the left picture and, and in the right picture. So the amount of current is the same sort of in both scenarios. However, I think if you live anywhere in the GTA, and I know some of you are kind of abroad right now um, in, in Europe or Asia, um, sometimes you're, you might even be in the west coast of Canada, um, but in the GTA at least, I think if you're, if you're at U of T at all, you've at least experienced the GTA, you can appreciate that many of our roads look like the three lanes of traffic picture. They're very congested, they're very stop and go, um, it's very stressful to drive in, and I would, love, I would love for our roads to look more like the six lanes of traffic. So even though they've got the same current, there's inherently a difference there. What does that difference mean? Um, that, that analogy of driving actually directly relates to, to a, a notion in, in uh, electricity. And that notion is resistance. You can absolutely have a lot of current that goes through a resistor. In fact, that's how incandescent light bulbs work. Incandescent light bulbs is a very, very thin piece of wire, which would be a very, very narrow gravel dirt road. And you are forcing a lot of current through that very small wire that has a very large resistance. That's like forcing thousands of cars to drive super fast through a tiny narrow dirt road. You know, you can do it, but it's gonna cause some problems. And um, the incandescent light bulb, I believe was Thomas Edison's invention. Um, the whole ingenious of that invention is you're taking advantage of those problems. The problem being that there's so much resistance in that small piece of wire that it heats up to a point that it glows. I don't know how much chemistry you remember from grade 12, but um, everything with a temperature will, will emit infrared radi will emit radiation. And uh, I think in grade 12 chemistry, you talked about the ultraviolet catastrophe where, you know, it, it looks like the hotter something is, the, the light that it emits goes closer and closer to UV. I don't want to get into the Boltzmann distribution or anything, but, you know, when you push a lot of current through a very small wire that has a high resistance, you're going to get it to heat up, which is what glows. That is exactly how an incandescent light bulb works. You're taking advantage of, of the property that a hot object will glow, literally glow that you can see with your eyes. Okay, putting a pin on resistance for a second. Let's talk about something more fundamental. We're talking about current. We know what current is. It's how many charges that move through a wire. Charges don't just spontaneously flow though. If you take a, you know, a, a piece of wire that isn't plugged into anything and you just hold it up, like, I don't know if you can see the camera right now, but I'm, I'm, I'm holding up a, a, a cable. There's no current in this cable. Well, why not? You know, your, your laptop, your phones are plugged into a charging cable. There is current charging uh, flowing through your charging cable. Why is current flowing in your charging cable but not flowing through here? What is it that makes these, current, uh, makes these charges actually flow and turn into a current? Well, you could ask yourself, yeah, okay, a battery. Duh, Mark, that's an easy question. Batteries make currents move. Okay, fine. What if you plug something into the wall? Okay, yeah, duh, Mark, you can plug something into the wall or make it a battery. Okay, so there's two answers to your question mark. Okay, I get that. But fundamentally, what is it about the battery that makes current move? Um, somebody had to invent our electrical grid in North America, even over in Asia. And, and in fact, in, 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 in Europe, you have a different voltage altogether. You need those adapters. Um, and same thing in Asia as well, right? So, um, what is it? What, what, why do we need to accommodate our, our devices like that? What is it that makes charge move and, and why do we need to accommodate it for different regions? So fundamentally, the answer to that is an electric field. We already know from electrostatics that F equals QE. And assuming the only force on the charged particle is the electric force, we can sort of say this is equal to MA. So fundamentally, if charges are moving, there is a non-zero electric field that is pushing them. 
Now, yes, you can talk about other things like, oh, well, what makes charges move a potential difference? A voltage difference. Yes, that's true. We use voltage as a metric to predict motion. But fundamentally, at a very, very, very fundamental level, what causes them to move? It's going to be an electric field within, within um, the conductor. Um, I pretty much just summed up that slide already. Um, and oh, I, I've also, I got, I've gotten way ahead of myself, sorry. So here we go. Um, we can use, yes, it's the, the fundamental thing that makes charges move is the electric field. However, um, we, we can also use voltage as a proxy, as a predictor, uh, as a characteristic to help us easily predict uh, where motion is going to happen. So in, in the context of, of circuits, um, yes, a current will exist if we can generate a non-zero voltage. And that's what's going to cause something to move. Now, I mentioned yesterday that when in doubt, you can always think of current and electricity concepts in the form of water flow. They are directly analogous in nearly every way. So what does it mean to have a potential difference when it comes to water flow? Well, with a river, that's easy. Gravity pulls water downstream, which is what causes the current or the potential difference in the, the stream. However, we have water parks that pump water up a very tall slide. You know, we have, we have water pumps, right? All this thing. So if you wanted an analogy between um, you know, the, 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 the water analogy that I've given you and what we're studying, what causes the voltage difference in terms of this analogy? It would be a water pump. I don't necessarily need a battery to get a current moving. I don't necessarily need a wall socket to get a current moving. I could use a solar panel to make a, a, a current generated in a circuit as well. By those same notions, there are multiple ways to get water flowing. It doesn't have to be gravity. I could use a water pump, which is literally like a fan that pushes water wherever I want it to go. So we now know voltage is the source, or, or it's a proxy for the source to make charges move. Next question, naturally, the scientist should be thinking, what is the the relationship between how much I push, meaning like the voltage difference, to what I actually get out, meaning current. That's what this slide is talking about, the relationship between voltage and current. How much current will result if I push with a certain voltage? This is called Ohm's law, V equals I R. Now, technically, Everything is ohmic on a very, very small scale. It is not ohmic on a macro, not everything, very few things actually are, are ohmic on a macro scale, but I don't want to, I don't want to get into that. Um, if, you're, if you're curious enough for your physics, we can talk about Ohm's law in greater detail, but um, generally now uh, for first year, you can uh, think of Ohm's law as just V equals IR, meaning this is the equation that governs how much oomph you have to put in in order to get a desired current output I. And the coupling factor there is resistance, where R is the resistance of the material. So there's Ohm's law there, V equals I R. Now, spoiler, not everything in life is ohmic. We'll talk about that shortly. Now, here's where things get fun. And I know physicists seem kind of arrogant uh, often that we, we can explain many fundamental things about the universe and you know, we pontificate them. There is a glaring mistake that physicists have made historically. And um, I frankly don't know why we still teach it this way, but we do maybe just because laziness, I don't know. But we talked about V equals IR. We talked about, um, I, current I, being the literal flow, flow or movement of charges. And now, presently, 
um, we know that the only charges that are allowed to move are electrons. So naturally, you're thinking, okay, Mark, if you've defined current to be the flow of charge, and the only charge that's allowed to move is, is electrons, naturally you think, okay, current is the flow of electrons. And you would be absolutely correct. Current is the flow of electrons. The problem here in this class with physics textbooks, um, with the field of physics in general, is that when we were discovering electricity, which was like back in, I don't know, the late 1800s, we did not yet know about the atom very well, let alone the electron. We didn't understand that the electron was the only charge that could move. So we, we talked about, and we were even ignorant to you know, what was negative and what was positive and, and a bunch of other things back then. So when we were formalizing these sort of ideas, it's naturally to think on the positive end of every situation. I don't know, I would like to give physicists the benefit of the doubt on that one, but um, we defined current to be the flow of positive charges, which of course we know now is ridiculous. Protons don't move, they're, they're fixed in place in the nucleus. But nonetheless, mathematically, you can easily define anything mathematical in any convention that you want. So unfortunately, even though this is technically um, the correct one in that it's the electrons that move, okay, that is technically in physics and reality that is technically correct. Mathematically, because we didn't know this at the time, please understand when your textbook, when I, um, honestly, even in real life, if you hire an electrician, they don't know it's the electrons that move. You know, th th this mistake has been so prevalent in, in today's society. It's, it's actually comical if you think about it. Please understand though, that the mistake is we falsely assumed that positive charges move. Now, it doesn't change our analysis, it doesn't change our math, um, because luckily, luckily, what saved our bacon is that the only difference between the things that do move, the electrons and the protons, is simply just a negative sign. We are lucky that the proton and the electron have the same magnitude of charge, they're just opposite signs as one another. If the proton had a different charge than the electron, um, this would be very messy. So luckily, we're only wrong by a factor of negative one. But for some reason, we have carried this mistake for a long time. A long time we've carried this mistake. So uh, please understand, moving forward, um, we will talk about what we call conventional current. Conventional current does not mean correct current. It just means, what are we used to doing? What is the world used to doing? It's convention. Even though it's not correct, it's convention. Um, Chemists, I know sometimes I harp on chemists and I make fun of chemists for some things, but chemists seem to be in mavericks in this regard, in that chemists do talk about electron flow quite readily and quite frequently. Um, this they do very well, and they are correct when they do talk about electron flow. But for some reason, it's kind of like the US and the metric system. They're objectively wrong that Fahrenheit makes sense, because it doesn't. Um, but they're so prolific that even here in Canada, we use feet. When we build things, all of our lumber is measured in inches. Um, we do it because it's convention, you know, I don't know. Anyway, so let's do an example. We've talked, well, I've talked, oh, I'm showing you the answer. Uh, we've talked at length uh, kind of about some new ideas. So here, uh, let's, let's see this. You double the voltage across a certain conductor and you observe that the current increases three times. What can you conclude? So you have some sort of um, wire segment. And we have a certain, we have a certain potential difference between point A and point B. If we, um, if we double this, if we double this potential difference, we're noticing that the current goes up by a factor of three. What can be said? Now, that's a very arbitrary question. Luckily, this is multiple choice. So let's look at kind of where the question is going with this. What can be said? 
Ohm's law is obeyed since the current will increase when V increases. Okay, so the, the multiple choice questions are talking about Ohm's law. So let's write down Ohm's law, V equals IR. The question says, um, the, current, the current increases when V increases. Well, that's true. We see in Ohm's law that when the voltage is increased uh, mathematically, the current should go up as well. But Ohm's law says more than that. Ohm's law says it's a direct proportionality, meaning it's not just increase, it's, it's the same amount of increase. If V goes up by two, the current should also go up by exactly two. That is what Ohm's law means. This, this depiction here, that does not happen. Current goes up by a factor of three, not two. So Ohm's law is in fact not obeyed. Um, B, Ohm's law is not obeyed. Okay, well, that's, that's true. Ohm's law is not obeyed. So that's probably the correct answer. And if we were on a test, we may not even waste our time reading the other ones. But for the sake of learning, let's read the other ones. This has nothing to do with Ohm's law. Well, we've already established it, Ohm's law is not obeyed, and that's already technically correct. So B is at least correct, right? So it can't be C. The resistance must be at least three times less than the current. Well, that, that doesn't make any sense. And the resistance must be at least three times larger than the current. Again, that doesn't make any sense. So after reading all the possibilities, um, the correct answer is going to be B, that um, although there's still current, although there's still a circuit, um, it's just not ohmic. It's not an ohmic circuit. So there you go. So um, very briefly, we have this notion of, of current, but not being ohmic, and circuits, but not being ohmic. So what does it mean for something to not be ohmic? Well, the definition of Ohm's law is simply V equals IR. Um, this literally means mathematically that V is proportional to I, and the proportionality constant is, is R, the resistance. This is what Ohm's law means. What does it mean for it to not be ohmic? All it means to not be ohmic is that V and I are not proportional to each other. It doesn't mean there's no circuit. It doesn't mean current doesn't flow. It just means V and I are not linearly dependent on one another. An example of what this might mean is that the resistance could change as a function of temperature. And this is often the case with metals. The hotter a metal gets, the more resistance it has. The hotter the metal gets, the harder it is for these electrons to freely move in and around the metal. That's just a property of chemistry and materials. I don't know if you've heard of something called a superconductor, but a superconductor is something that is cooled, presumably with liquid nitrogen or liquid helium, depending exactly on what you're doing. And um, the reason why it's crucial that something be cooled is that the temperature goes down so far that that conductor is not ohmic in that when temperature drops, the resistance also drops. If you had an ohmic resistor, it wouldn't matter what temperature it is, hot, cold, medium, room temperature, it wouldn't matter. It would be the same resistance. So one, one possibility something could not be ohmic is if the resistance of that material uh, changed as a function of time, or sorry, changed as a function of temperature. Um, one very common example of this, as I mentioned, yes, is metals, but something that you might use in, a, in your day-to-day -day lives, things like light bulbs. Light bulbs are objects that are designed to change with, with time in terms of temperature, right? When the light bulb is off, it's very, well, it's room temperature, but when the light bulb is on, it generates heat from the resistance. The heat from the resistance then heats up the metal. The, 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 as the metal heats up, the resistance goes up, which causes more heat, which causes blah, blah, blah. It's like, it's like a vicious cycle, right? Now, once the, the temperature of the bulb reaches equilibrium and the temperature of the bulb no longer continues to rise, then as long as it's that temperature, that, that uh, bulb is ohmic. Because as long as it's that temperature, the voltage and the current are proportional to one another. However, it's just when, when you change things over time, that's when temperature can change over time, and then that's when 
um, v equals ir is no longer valid. OK. What are some factors that might affect resistance? A few slides ago, you will recall we talked about the cars with the three lanes and the six lanes of traffic. Okay. So the same analogy is true with current in wires. If you have a very thin wire, you're not allowing very many electrons, well, yes, electrons to sort of move freely, right? Because you're, you're forcing them all into like a one way street or a one lane street. And you're going to slow them down a lot. There's going to be a lot of uh, metaphoric friction between them, right? Just like when you have a, a large volume of cars on a two lane highway. So clearly, um, if something's wider, you're going to um, reduce the amount of, of uh, resistance that that object has. Another factor is length. If you only have to drive in three lanes for a kilometer, it'll slow down traffic a little bit for one kilometer. But after it opens up into six lanes, traffic will return back to normal, for instance. Um, Weirdly, in, with current, that's not how that works, but we won't talk about that quite yet. Um, but point being, um, if you have to drive a longer distance with, a, with a, a pinch point, then that'll bog traffic down more than if there was only a very brief pinch point. Um, another way maybe to, to acknowledge this is say, um, let's say there's one pothole on the road. Well, I can deal with one pothole very easily. It doesn't really slow cars down. You just kind of run over the pothole and you're like, well, that was bumpy. I'm glad there aren't more. But if you saw with your eyes, there were many potholes in your lane, you would actually slow your car right down. So the longer the road is, the longer the wire is, um, the more resistance there will be of that object uh, as well. Oh, I should really be more on top of scrolling. So yeah, here, here is um, kind of what I already mentioned about the lanes of traffic. Um, here's what I mentioned about the potholes. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave us? There are sort of three, three attributes of a, a physical object, like a wire or you know, battery or, or what have you. Three physical attributes that govern resistance of, of a very specific material. It's, it's area. It's cross-sectional area. I've already said, you know, as radius increases, as the road gets wider, you're going to make it easier for the cars to drive. You're going to make it easier for charge to flow. So there's that sort of inverse relation. As A gets bigger, R goes down, inverse. So I would say the resistance is proportional to 1 over A. We've already talked about the length of the road. If there is a patchy road, if I have to drive farther on the patchy road, that makes the problem worse. So it's a direct relation. So R is proportional to L, meaning as L goes up, R goes up. And um, then of course, there's the quality of the road as well. Is it brand new pavement that was paved a week ago? Or is it 30 years old and is it all pit hole and pot -hole and you know debris filled? Um, that, that's the, the type of, of road it is. We call that row. I know row has popped up in the past with other things, um, but I did mention, I think, first lecture, I believe, I did mention that um, there was the conductivity sigma and the resistivity row. This is the resistivity row. Um, I would say that R is proportional to rho. So putting that all together, uh, I understand these are all proportionalities, and there may have been a proportionality constant to sort of sort them all out. However, empirically, when you, when you study this in the lab, um, they're not. Empirically, when you, when you look at these three factors, length, area, and, and uh, resistivity, um, in this combination, it is a direct, it is, there is no, the proportionality constant is one. That's a fluke. That is not, uh, there's no physical explanation as to why that has to be true. It, it's just a fluke that it's that way. So here's how you calculate the resistance of a specific object. Now, please understand the implications of this. Rho is a property 
of material. Meaning I could have two copper wires in my hand. I could have one very thin copper wire and one so thick that I, I would probably need two hands to hold it. Okay? They're both made of copper. They will both have the same resistivity rho. However, those two pieces of wire will have different resistances because even though they're both made of copper, they will have different cross-sectional areas. They may even have different lengths, maybe. So the first lab that you will perform, I believe it becomes available today. If not today, then tomorrow. I, I can't exactly remember off the top of my head, but um, it it, your first lab is gonna be on resistivity. And this is exactly what the lab is on. It's this equation, R equals rho uh, L over A. And this lab, had you done it in person, which is unfortunate that you can't, um, really shows you that if you have two wires that are the same length but different material, they're going to have different resistances. Um, if you have two wires that are the same length, same material, but different diameters, they're going to have different resistances. So that lab really hits home kind of this, this exact equation right here. So this is exactly what your lab is going to be on. So just to help you further understand this equation, um, let's just look at this example question. Two wires, A and B, are made of the same metal and have equal length, but the resistance of the wire A is four times the resistance of wire B. How do their diameters compare? Okay, so let's write down that equation again. Okay, R equals rho L over A. So what do we know? They're made of the same material, okay? So rho is constant, but the resistance of the wire A is four times that of B. So the resistance of wire A is four times the resistance of wire B. How do their, di oh, and um, equal length and same metal. So here, the resistance of A is gonna be rho L over A equals four rho L, I should really say area of A and area of B. However, rho is the same on, on both A and B. L is the same on both A and B. So now we get this sort of relationship where we say one over the cross-sectional area of wire one is gonna be four times, uh, four over the cross-sectional area of wire B. And uh, solving for that, we're going to get AB equals four times AA. And here you're going to, they're talking about how the diameter compares. I suppose you have to make a small um, deduction from that. The question is implying that um, they're round wires, they're cylindrical wires, as wires usually are um, evidenced by, you know, looking down at your charging cable, you see wires around. We could have, I don't know why humans, I mean, we could have made wires rectangular. When we, when we manufacture wires, it's just easier when they're round, I guess. So knowing that they're round, we can replace area with um, pi um, d over two squared equals, oh, I said it's b, um, pi d of a over two squared, pi r squared, right, is the area of a circle. So everything can't, well, most things cancel, cancel, cancel cancel, cancel, and we get db squared equals the diameter of a squared. Oh, sorry, um, I missed a four, 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 which means the diameter of b equals twice the diameter of a. So there you go, you have your example now. So b is twice as large. Um, it depends kind of how the multiple choice is looking for it. Um, they're putting it in terms of A. So if I rearrange for A, the diameter of A is gonna be DB over two. So now, now we can compare apples to apples. Um, DA is four, nope. Four B, nope. DA is two B, nope. They're equal, nope. Uh, there you go, the answer is D. Again, I know it was circled, I'm being facetious here, but you know, there you go. Okay. Moving on. 
So um, we briefly, very, very briefly in 136, touched upon the notion of electrical power. Sorry, not electrical power, uh, regular power. Um, we didn't dwell on it because it doesn't really add anything in the context of, of macroscopic physical physics, like pulleys and forces and stuff like that. Um, I touched upon it briefly enough to mention what the formula was. And the definition of power is the rate of change of energy consumption. So mathematically, the definition of power, I suppose, is the, the derivative of E with respect to time. But another way to write that is just how many joules of energy are used over a certain length of time, t. Now, that, it makes sense. You can talk about the power of, you know, lifting a fridge up some stairs. Um, this equation is actually what explains why you get tired when you, when you run upstairs versus walk upstairs. Um, if you walk up six steps versus run up six steps, you're still having the same change of gravitational energy, right? Whether you're walking or running up the steps, you, you're still elevating yourself by the same amount. The steps versus walking up the steps, well, you are, you are consuming the same amount of joules of energy in a shorter period of time. That's harder for your, your human bodies to do. That's harder for nature to do. That's why, that's what power is. Now, electrical power, uh, weirdly, I think makes more sense in this context than just talking about the power of running up some stairs. Power is going to be the electrical, the, in this case, electrical power is gonna be the electrical energy that is consumed per unit of time. Well, this doesn't have to involve a capacitor. I'm just deriving this equation for you. Um, well, actually, no, let's, let's, let's not do, well, okay. We know, we know current is charge per unit time. Okay. And we know, we know energy. Well, we know the work done is Q delta, Q delta V, that's a terrible delta sign. We know the work done is Q delta V. Now the work done is how much energy it takes to move a charged particle from a location A to location B, right? So this is analogous, well, it's not analogous, it's, it's equal to the energy it takes to move uh, a certain particle. So let's see the rate, at, the rate of, of, of consumption of this energy. Do we move this charge from A to B very quickly in one second? Or do we move this charge from A to B in 10 seconds or a minute or 10 minutes or a day? You know, that, that's the same, we're consuming the same amount of energy, but the difference in time changes how, how exhausted we will feel at the end of it. So energy is, Q delta V, and the definition of power is you divide by T. And what you do is you associate, because multiplication division, you can sort of uh, reorder the sort of division all you want. You associate the Q and the delta T uh, over top of one another. And this is the very definition that we said earlier of, uh, of, of current. Current is how much charge Q uh, moves past a certain spot per unit of time t. So you can replace q over delta t with current i. So this is the electrical power equation, p equals i v. Um, I remember when I learned this in high school, my, my physics teacher in high school said piv. Piv, 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 power is piv. The reason why my, my high school physics teacher said piv as a sort of memorization tool is because there are other rearrangements of this equation and they can get confusing what's squared, what's on the bottom, blah, 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 blah. Um, the rearrangements are obtained by using Ohm's law. So if we start with P equals IV, maybe we can use Ohm's law to swap out V and then we can get I times IR. And here you're gonna get I squared R. 
right? So that's where this comes from. Or if you don't want to swap out V, maybe you want to swap out I, you can use Ohm's law to, swap, uh, to solve for I. I is going to be V over R. And then um, from here, you can swap out I. So I is going to be V over R times V. You're going to get V squared over R, which is where this equation comes from. Again, do not memorize these equations, OK? If you understand what power is, and we learned what power is briefly in 136. We reviewed it now. Power is simply energy per unit time. You already know what the energy of a charged particle is. It's Q delta V. You already know the definition of current is Q over T. So you can easily obtain or remember, if you will, um, what the, the base power equation is, people's IV. And there's no need to memorize all of the other rearrangements because you already know Ohm's law. If, if you go about trying to memorize, okay, power is P equals IV, power equals I squared over R, po uh, power equals V squared over R, you're treating them as sort of separate independent equations that have no relationship to one another. When they do have a relationship to one another, um, you're also, by, by memorizing the three of them separately, you're ignoring the, the what relates them to one another. It's Ohm's law that relates them to one another. So it's much better to sort of practice and approach your learning and your homework and your studying by, by fostering and practicing these sort of higher level connections. Okay, here's an example. You have two space heaters in your living room. Now it's, it's summer right now, hot as, hot as heck. So you obviously wouldn't be having space heaters in your living room now, but let's say it's a Canadian winter and it's like, you know, minus 10 in April which I think actually happened this past April, which was hilarious. Satirically hilarious, because that's sad for our planet, but nonetheless, it happened. Um, anyway, besides the point, two space heaters in your living room are operated at a known voltage of 120 volts. That's coming from the fact that in North America, uh, the voltage of our wall outlets is 120 volts. Heater one is known to have twice the resistance of heater two. Which one will give off more heat? Well, heat, you have to understand, is energy. And presumably, if you're comparing which one will give off more heat, you're presumably, you're implying um, same length of time. You know, obviously, if you, if you have one on for like a second and one on for four years, obviously, the one on for four years is, is going to throw more heat, obviously. But if you're, if you're trying to compare, um, you know, which heater works better, obviously, you're talking about the same length of time. So here, you're wanting to know which heater provides more energy with the same unit of time. So this tells me we're looking for power. So I know we're not solving for energy directly. We can solve for energy indirectly. We know whichever heater is going to have a larger power is going to throw more heat because um, this is the variable and this is constant between the two scenarios, heater one and heater two. So whichever one has the larger power is going to have the larger E, the larger energy. So we know power is IV. Which one is going to have uh, a larger, um, well, well, sorry, before we get there, we know, we know voltage. Voltage equals 120. Um, we know something about the resistance. So the resistance of one is twice the resistance of two. So we're not told anything about the current in the problem. So that tells me we have to swap out current for something else. So use Ohm's law, V equals IR. Uh, you're going to swap out current, and you're going to get V squared over R for power. So this is the useful power equation in this context. Now we see both heaters will have the same voltage. They're both plugged into the same North American wall outlet. 
I mean, there might be physically different outlets, but every outlet in North America is, is 120 volts. So you know they have the same voltage. So the only difference between these two, power one is going to be proportional to one over R1, and power two is going to be proportional to one over uh, R2, but R2 is R1 over two. So power one is proportional to one over R1, but power two is actually proportional to two over R1. So that means power two is going to be higher. And that means P2 being higher means E2 is gonna be higher, which means E2 is gonna throw more heat. So that means heater two is gonna be throwing more heat. Okay, so I think we're finally now out of time to start talking about basics of circuits. Um, we've talked about current, meaning flow of charges. We've talked about resistance. Um, we have a notion of voltage. We know what relates the push to what we get out, um, we, the push being voltage to what we get out being current. So that's Ohm's law, V equals IR. Um, I think now we're finally at a point where we can just get to the finish line and talk about what is a circuit and how to analyze a circuit. So let's establish some syntax, some symbols. So scientists such as yourselves and I can, can communicate effectively about these ideas. In a circuit diagram that we draw on paper, if we draw just a simple line, that represents just a wire. If we draw a line, it doesn't have to be pink, but if we draw a line with a squiggle in it, that's the symbol for resistor. It doesn't have to be pink, please understand that. It could be the same color you draw the wire with. Now, a resistor is generic. A resistor could be a light bulb. A resistor could be a motor. A resistor could be a fan that you have plugged in when it's hot. A resistor could be a heater when you have plugged in when it's cold. A resistor is anything that uses up electricity. This symbol is the battery, and the battery is drawn very concisely. When you draw a battery, you draw a battery, a battery with two vertical lines of unequal length. The one with the larger length is always taken to be the positive end of the battery, and the one with the smaller length is always taken to be the negative end of the battery. Um, this arrow, just to be clear, this arrow for positive terminal is pointing to the large end of the battery, okay? It will matter immensely moving forward in this course which side of the battery you can identify to be positive. It, it is a very crucial piece of information. Um, this symbol here is not used very frequently. Um, some physics teachers like to teach it, but in practice we don't really deal with it anyway, so I choose to not really teach it. Um, if you see questions that have this in it, please ignore them. Um, for context, if you're curious, this just means you have a battery that has its own sort of internal resistance. Meaning if you have a, a 12 volt battery that's just sitting on, the, on, on your desk, not connected to anything, and you measure the voltage of the 12 volt battery, it will measure less than 12 volts because there's a sort of inherent resistance in the battery itself. Technically speaking, every battery has an internal resistance. When you buy a nine volt battery, uh, or hell, even when you buy a double A battery, a double A battery is, is 1.5 volts, supposedly. If you measure the voltage of a brand new one, uh, a double A battery, it actually measures more than 1.5 volts. And that's because you know, no battery is perfect. Um, there's an internal resistance to every battery. So you know, in order to avoid sort of calculating this you know, stupid thing, they just pump in more voltage in a new battery. So when you put a load on it, it drops down to 1.5 as it's rated for. And then you can just ignore the internal battery. So I, we won't be doing many questions with, with that because I think that's just dumb. 
Uh, real life also thinks that's the dumb. They just make batteries slightly higher voltage and then that way it sorts itself out. Um, this symbol here is a capacitor. Um, it's hard to draw nice symbols like this with your pen. So a battery, this is a battery. Um, now here, if you're drawing a capacitor, you draw a capacitor very similarly, but a capacitor is drawn with um, the same the same length of lines. The batteries with with a a, a, a long line and a short line. The capacitor is with uh, two long lines. So this is a capacitor. Capacitor. Okay. Um, this is what we call a switch. It could be a light switch. Um, it could be one of those ghetto switches where you literally just like cut the wire with some scissors and like hold the wire together. Um, a switch literally just means a break in the circuit. You're interrupting um, the, the con connectivity of the circuit. Um, a light bulb is a very specific type of resistor. Um, frankly, I, I don't know why we have a special symbol for light bulbs and not any other common items like fans, but Regardless, if you ever see this in a question or something like that, it means light bulb. You can treat it as resistor. If you see this symbol, this is a device that uh, can be used to measure the voltage across two places in a circuit. It's called a potentiometer or, or um, a voltmeter. Um, voltmeter is kind of more, more obvious. A potentiometer measures potential, you know, potential meter, potentiometer. Um, so another, another phrase for voltage is potential, right? So um, this is the symbol for the device used to measure voltage. And this is called an ammeter. Uh, ammeter measures current. And I, I, I apologize, I, I think I forgot to mention the unit for, for current. So we know current is defined to be the change in charge over time. So we know this is gonna be a Coulomb per second. It's really annoying to say, Oh, I've got so many coulombs per second in my wire. That's a mouthful. We've actually defined a new unit for this, and we've called it AMP. Or A, we've called it A, but it stands for amps and ampere. Again, uh, Ampere is, is a scientist. Uh, they have, he has a, one of Maxwell's equations named after him, Ampere's Law, which we will get to later in this class. So um, hopefully you're noticing a pattern. Every time you are having to invent a new unit in, in this sort of um, realm, uh, it's named after one of the four prolific scientists uh, in, in, this, in this realm. Actually, um, you might remember Gauss. The unit for flux from Gauss's law is actually Gauss, which is appropriately named because it, it was kind of invented from his law, Gauss's law. Anyway, so an ammeter measures current. So, you know, if you want to know how much current uh, is in a circuit, you can use an ammeter, and that's the symbol for it. Okay, so um, we can now talk about what a circuit looks like and how to analyze a circuit. So this is an example of, uh, I don't want to say a simple circuit, but a relatively simple circuit. Uh, we have a battery right there. And we have a, a battery that generates eight volts. Now in real life, there is no market battery that you can just buy at a store that, that has eight volts. I mean, there are nine volt batteries. Double A's are one and a half volts. Triple A's are also one and a half volts. Um, but there, there is no eight volt battery. So it's kind of a silly question. But anyway, it's an eight volt battery in this question. And it's hooked up to this particular circuit. Um, there are a, a slew of resistors here. and um, you know, a natural question would be kind of what kind of voltage does each resistor feel? How much current does each resistance feel, a resistor feel? Um, please understand that these, these resistors could be anything. They, they literally could just be a simple carbon resistor and not do anything. Or they could be lights, they could be a TV, they could be a stereo, a speaker, um, a laptop, literally anything that draws current. So, I'm trying to say that this circuit could represent something more complicated, um, like the lights in your van or you know, the circuit in your kitchen. Um, it, it, it's an arbitrary circuit. Now, you'll notice here that 
I, I've used the, well, sorry, I've used the analogy of, of um, current like water in, in a river. Coming back to that analogy for a second, you know current is going to be coming out of the battery, right? Because batteries causes a, a potential difference. And when there's a potential difference, there's a current. So we know um, conventional current, maybe I'm going to change to red, conventional current will come out of the battery. And I know it's, it's electrons that are technically moving, not protons, but conventional current is positive charges. So I'm going to draw current coming out of the positive end of the battery, the large long end of the battery. And then current is going to come this way. Okay. Now, current is going to hit a junction right here, and the current will split. Part of the current will go this way. Part of the current will go this way. How much will go one way? How much will go the other way? I don't know. That's really a question that we're trying to answer. Uh, there's another split right here. Whatever current makes it through here, there's actually another split this way and this way. Again, how much current goes through one versus the other one? I don't know. That's the question at hand. So here's the technique to solve or to analyze a circuit. We recognize that there are sort of two, two ways to combine resistors. There's something called series, meaning you put resistors end to end. So we have resistor one um, in literally directly connected to resistor two, directly connected to resistor three. They're called series one after another one. Now, does this mean they have to be, like, for instance, does this mean, does this mean this? Oh my God, those are really bad resistors. I apologize, guys. Um, does this mean these are not in series because there is some wire in between them? No, they, they're still in series. Um, please understand that they don't, they don't literally have to be touching each other like what was drawn in, in, in this diagram. What it means to be in series is that there is no other, no other things between the two resistors other than the, the wire itself. So whether I make this wire really long, whether I make this wire really short, it doesn't matter. These are both in series with one another. Now, another way to hook up a resistor with, with a second resistor or even third resistor is something called parallel. And the way you do it in parallel, as the name implies, um, they are not in line with one another. They are parallel to one another, just like parallel vectors. You know, if you, if you had a vector here and a vector here and a vector here, they are parallel vectors. So we call those parallel resistors. Now, more fundamentally or more physically, um, what is the difference between series resistors and parallel resistors? Resistors in series will feel different voltages compared to their neighbors. So for instance, resistor one will feel a voltage of VAB. Right? It's the voltage between point A and the voltage between point B. And R2 will feel uh, a voltage of VBC, the voltage between point B and point C. And um, these will not be equal to each other. I mean, they might, they, they might by fluke be equal to each other by, by fluke, but the whole point of a series resistor is there is nothing that forces them to be equal to one another. Of course, they might by fluke be equal to one another, but that's, that's not the point. Parallel resistors, if you look at the diagram here, they will feel the same voltage drop for each resistance. So here, if you look, this is a perfect wire that connects the tip of R1 down to point A. And this green, is a perfect wire that connects the tip of R3 to A. And this blue is a perfect wire that connects resistor 2 to part A. Perfect wires do not eat, eat up any, any voltage. So each of these resistors have the same starting point for parallel. And each of the resistors have the same end point, B, when they're in parallel. So this means that 
the voltage of one is going to be VA, oh boy. The voltage of one is going to be VAB. The voltage of two is going to be VAB. And the voltage of three is going to be VAB. They all have the same voltage. They're forced to have the same voltage. What is forced to be true with series resistors is that the current of resistor one equals the current through resistor two. The reason this is true is what goes in must come out. If you think of this as sort of a river, you know, you might have some, some um, rapids, some rocks over here to cause some turbulence. But if you have water flowing, whatever, whatever current, whatever current in the water is up here has to be the same current down here. You can't get out more water at the bottom of the river than you are at the top, putting in at the top of the river. That doesn't make sense. You also can't get, get less water out at the bottom of the river than you put in. I mean, otherwise the river is overflowing and then you have another stream, right? In which case it's, it's, part, of the, it's part of the river. So um, whatever current goes in has to come out. So this forces the series resistors to all have the same current, but they will have different voltages. Here in parallel, I've already established they're gonna have the same voltages as each other, but they will have different current because one, the total current comes in and then it splits three ways. So that's the difference between series and, uh, series and parallel. Series, same current, different voltage. Parallel, different current, same voltage. So they're opposites. So this begs the question, how do you analyze them? Well, let's say we had um, three series. Oh, that's terrible. Whew, boy. Let's say we had three series resistors. And let's say I wanted to replace three independent, oh, let me just scroll down. Let's say you want to replace three independent resistors with one resistor, but you don't want to change the circuit. You don't want to make it uh, more resistance, less resistance. You just don't, I've got three independent resistors. I don't want to put three in. There's too many wires, too many things to go wrong. I just want to put one in. How do you find the equivalent resistance of of those three resistors. When they are in this, this, sorry, this topic is called combining series resistors. So here's the logic. Our goal is to transform a three resistors to B into one resistor. That's our goal. So what do we say here? Well, in both of these cases, the voltage drop between case one and case two is both VAB. So what's the total voltage drop in the first case? Well, it's going to be the voltage drop to, um, from A to, let's say, X, where this is point X. We can call this point Y. Um, plus the voltage drop from X to Y, plus the voltage drop from Y to B. Well, what's the voltage drop between A and X? Well, Ohm's law, V equals IR, so it's going to be the current times resistance 1. I should really say current 1 times resistance 1. And Ohm's law, again, for resistor 2, current two times resistance two plus current three times resistance three. Now, because they're in series, the current through the first resistor is the same as the current through the second resistor, and that's the same as the current through um, the third resistor. So all of these currents are actually the same, and you can factor out current from this equation. 
And you see here what you're getting is uh, you're getting the sum of the independent resistors. So I'm going to call this REQ. And we see here that REQ is simply just R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus dot, dot, dot. Maybe we have more than three. Maybe we have less than three. So the way you combine series resistors is you simply just add all the resistances together. So that's what this next slide here says. And here's, a, here's that derivation. It, that derivation started on the, on the previous slide for you. OK, that was easy enough. How do we combine parallel resistors? Well, parallel resistors follow a different guideline. Parallel resistors each of them has the same voltage drop. So it wouldn't make sense to add the voltage drops of with each one, because that would just give me three times VAB. Right? Before, with a series, I know that the sum of the three of them had to equal the voltage between A and B. But with parallel, each of them is voltage AB. So adding them is just going to give me three VAB. That's not very helpful. What is, and this is more of like a, a clever trick than anything, um, what is helpful is whatever current comes in will eventually have to come out. If I have, let's say, I don't know, one amp of current coming in, that one amp will have to partially split to go up, partially split to go down, and partially go straight ahead. I don't know what ratio that's going to happen. It could be 1, 1, and 8. It could be 7, 2, and 1 you know, five, four, and one. I don't know. That's kind of what we're trying to find out, right? It's going to have to split, but at the end of the day, they all have to come back together and recombine to give I at the end. So really what we do here is we say the current in has to equal the current out. More specifically, we say the current in the top one plus the current in the middle one plus the current in the bottom one, all, when you add up all the current, they must all equal the total current, I. That's where we're going. So, OK, we've set up our equation. And then we say, OK, Ohm's law, V equals I, R. Previously, with series, we were dealing with Vs. Now we're dealing with I. So let's rearrange for I. I equals V over R. So this is going to be. Um, voltage between A and B divided by the equivalent resistance between A and B. This is going to be um, the voltage of the top divided by the resistance of the top. In this case, that's going to be 1. Plus the middle is going to be the uh, voltage of the middle divided by the resistance of the middle, which is 2, plus the voltage of the bottom divided by the resistance of the bottom or no, that's resistance three, sorry. And again, as I mentioned earlier, um, the thing that's in common with parallel resistors is that the voltage between here and here, here and here, here and here is all VAB. Every single one of them is, is VAB. So this is VAB, this is VAB, and this is VAB. And then that allows us to cancel all the VABs on the left and on the right. And what we end up getting is 1 over REQ, oops, equals 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3 plus dot, dot, dot. If you had more, you would obviously just have more. So this slide reiterates what I've just verbally described. Um, so you can look back on the, the logic later if you need it when you're reviewing. Um, it also shows you the derivation step by step in the slide, but I thought it would be uh, helpful if I wrote it out myself. And this is your final equation here for combining uh, parallel resistors. Okay, now a natural question would be, what do we do about capacitors? Right, we learned about capacitors. Capacitors um, have a voltage across them, they store energy. Um, they're part of circuits because they, they sort of act like batteries. So what if we had multiple capacitors in a circuit? What do we do? Well, 
let's look. Again, let's start with fundamentals. If you had two capacitors in series with one another, then all you know is that you have a total voltage difference of VAB. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing to remember. There is an air gap between the parallel plate capacitors. If there's an air gap between the parallel plate capacitors, it literally means the circuit is broken. There is no conducting material that touches plate one and plate two together. Otherwise, it would just be a wire. So if there is no circuit, no complete circuit, then the current in this section is zero. If the current in the section is zero, we can't use Ohm's law because there's no current. V equals IR. It doesn't even make any sense when there's no current. So we have to use something else. And what we do here is we rely on um, conservation of charge and the capacitance equation. Q equals CV. So let's say we have a battery hooked up to the circuit. Let's call it, I don't know, a nine volt battery. I'm guessing. Nine volts, let's say. With a potential difference V, then what happens is this plate is positively charged because it's touching the positive end of the battery. And this plate is negatively charged because it's touching the negative end of the battery. Now, I don't know what happens in the middle yet, but all I know is that there is going to be a charge separation between the top plate and the bottom plate according to nine volts of pushing. If I pushed harder, maybe with 18 volts or 20 volts, maybe I could get, I could get more charge separation on these plates. But if I'm only pushing for nine volts, I'm gonna get nine volts worth of charge separation. What does that mean? Well, if you look carefully, let me erase all of my scribbles. If you look carefully, we have this middle segment that is electrically not connected to the rest of the circuit. We have the inside plate of the top capacitor and the top plate of the second capacitor are connected to each other, but those two pieces are not able to touch any other part of the circuit. They are electrically isolated from everything else. So what we're doing here is remember way back in our first lecture when we talked about how to, uh, how, to, how to manipulate charges, there was rubbing, there was conduction, and then there was induction, charge separation. That's what's happening here. Because of this hypothetical battery, oops, that's a capacitor. Because of this hypo hypothetical battery, we are forcing positive charges to accumulate on this side. We are forcing negative charges to accumulate on this side. What this does is out of all of the neutral material in the middle, what you're doing is you are attracting all the negative charges from this lump of metal and thus leaving the other side positive. Now, why do I say conservation of charge? Because if you have five, five positive charges on the top plate from the battery, conservation of charge. Five protons will attract or, uh, five electrons. So you're going to get minus five um, Q on the bottom plate. Well, if you're stealing five negative charges from this neutral object and you're pulling five negative charges to one side, then that leaves the other side plus 5q charged. Now, altogether, you see how positive 5 and negative 5 cancel to become neutral. We are not, we're not saying the isolated middle part is now charged. We're saying there's a charge separation in the middle part. And again, if this is, um, if this is positive 5, then this will be negative five because it's from the same battery. So this is where conservation of charge comes in. And um, this is what we say, the charge on each of the two plates must be the same. This is the key 
to studying capacitors in series. Is that when capacitors are in series, the charge on those plates must be the same. So now that we've established that, we say, okay. Then we say um, the, the charge, the charge on the plates must be the same. That, that, that's helpful. Um, let's, let's, we, we know that point A, point B, okay? We know the total voltage has to be voltage AB. So the voltage drop across capacitor one plus the voltage drop across capacitor two has to be, the sum of them has to be VAB. Now we can't use Ohm's law, so we use, um, as I mentioned before, Q equals CV, where we are rearranging for V, so V equals Q over C. So this is gonna be Q over C equivalent. And this is gonna be Q, or I should really say Q total, this is gonna be um, Q1 over um, C1 plus Q2 over C2, okay? Now, Here's why the preamble was important. Because of conservation of charge, we know that Q1 has to equal Q2. They're, e they're equal to each other. So that tells us we can actually factor out Q and say one over C1 plus one over C2 is gonna equal Q total over C equivalent. This tells me that Q total is simply equal to Q, which we already sort of knew because we said all the charges have to be the same. Um, but this specifically tells me, oops, this specifically tells me that the equivalent capacitance is given by one over C1 plus one over C2 plus dot, 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 dot. However many series capacitors you happen to have. So, I know this is new and that logic is sort of fresh and it may not make perfect sense. This is why you need time to have things percolate and review and reflect. Um, however, if you want sort of a helpful hint, series, uh, sorry, um, capacitors and resistors are opposite to each other. Combining a series resistance, you add the resistors, R1 plus R2 plus R3. A capacitor, as long as you remember a capacitor is opposite, then you say, okay, well, uh, in, instead of saying C1 plus C2 plus C3, you're adding the inverses, like you would a parallel resistor. And then the same is true with parallel resistors. With parallel resistors, you do one over R1, one over R2, one over R3. Um, however, what do you think is gonna happen when you have combining parallel capacitors? It's gonna be the same result. C1 plus C2 plus C3, it's the opposite. So I'll let you go through the details. We're, we're kind of running short on time, but the takeaway here is that they are opposite to one another, okay? So a series, um, uh, the, a series capacitor would be the same as a parallel uh, resistor. And, and uh, same thing with, with um, parallel resistors being the same as series capacitors. Okay, um, that is, the end of, of sort of circuits. Um, we have seven minutes left. I know we've been kind of ending late sometimes, so maybe it's kind of nice to end a little bit early. Maybe I'll take a few questions in the last five minutes. Um, so for tomorrow's lecture, we will open with maybe doing sort of an example problem. I'm hoping you guys can find some time today to um, not only start your lab, I think your lab becomes available today, but um, you know, spend some time today reviewing some textbook problems relating to circuits. You know, we talked about resistors, we talked about Ohm's law, we talked about current, um, we talked about power, we talked about um, capacitors and how to combine circuits. So there is a lot of material for you to practice. Um, I don't expect anyone to be proficient and confident and amazing at it with, with one afternoon of practicing. So um, it will take work. I will do an example tomorrow morning uh, before we do more material. And um, tomorrow is Thursday, which means every single, uh, every single one of you has a tutorial tomorrow at some point in the day. Many of you, it'll be one to three. Um, I think tutorial five has it from seven till nine. Um, so that'll be your chance to sort of 
practice a worksheet that has these concepts in it, dealing with Ohm's law and things like that as well. And your TA will work through some questions for you. So, um, you know, hopefully you're not feeling too lost by, by the speed of the lectures. I know the summer class is accelerated and I know it's hard and there's a lot of information in two hours. And, you know, the next, the very next day is just a, a new smattering of information. It, it's not ideal for anyone, but, um, you know, I, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that having everyone have tutorials on Thursdays immediately after the three lectures in a row, um, I'm hoping that allows you to better practice sort of these, these new ideas while they're fresh in your head. Anyway, okay, so I'm going to, I'll keep the recording on because I think there might be some good questions going on. I'm going to open the chat and I'm going to take some questions now if there are um, any, any outstanding questions. Um, is that all we need for the pre-lab YouTube video posted? Um, well, not just, so for the pre-lab, um, you, yes, definitely you should be watching the YouTube video that's posted, but you can also use the, uh, the lab manual that we post as well. Some of, uh, many of the answers will also come from the lab manual. Um, the YouTube video is just us mimicking performing the lab in two minutes. Um, so not all the details are necessarily in the video, but you can always read through the introduction of the lab manual and, and kind of the steps that we have students do in the lab manual. And you can read that to help you answer the pre-lab. Could you quickly explain the definition of capacitance again? Sure. Um, the capacitance, so we have this analogy between electricity and, and sort of like water flow, either stagnant water for electrostatics or rivers with electrodynamics. Um, buckets, for instance, buckets can hold water, can hold liquid. How much water can a bucket hold? That's a function of its volume. And volume is very easy to get on board with because you can touch it, you can feel it, you can see it. You have experience with volumes of buckets, okay? How much charge a capacitor can hold is analogous to how much water a bucket can hold. And we've given a word for that for, for a bucket, it's volume. So we've given a word or a quantity uh, for how much uh, charge a capacitor can hold. Uh, we've called that capacitance. Now, it's fine to sort of coin that idea and, and to get on board with, yes, Mark, uh, capacitors, Different capacitors can hold different amounts of charge. Yes, we call that capacitance. The question though is, um, how can we look at one capacitor and compare it to another capacitor? How can we tell this capacitor here uh, can, can hold more charge than this other capacitor? What attributes of the capacitor allow us to sort of do that? With, with buckets, it's, it's simply the volume of the bucket. Um, what goes into the volume of the bucket? Well, it's depth, it's height, it's width, stuff like that. What goes into the volume of a capacitor? Well, evidently, it's the area of the plates, it's the plate separation, and it's the material between the two plates, whether it be a vacuum for epsilon naught, whether we put a dielectric in there. So that's what we've called capacitance, and it allows us to sort of compare different capacitors to one another. And we've summed up that quantity in one neat little number called uh, capacitance, which is measured in farads. So, you know, a, a 15 microfarad capacitor has the ability to hold more charge than, say, a 5 microfarad capacitor. And this number makes it very quick and easy to sort of compare uh, how large one capacitor is compared to another one. And you might be thinking to yourself, um, well, why not just use the biggest capacitor possible? Well, you know, in your cell phones, your $1,000 cell phones, you don't want large fat capacitors that can deliver fatal blows um, you know, if, if, if you touch them with your hands. You, know, you don't need that in, in, in your phone. You need smaller capacitors. So it, it's not always as simple as just the biggest you got, let's do it, right? So we need this sort of way to understand how to design capacitors to suit the needs that we need them for. So hopefully that, that, makes, um, that answers your question. 
Grace, is there a way to open um, the lab files earlier? I believe right now you can only open them after 5 p.m. Yeah, um, that, that there was no, yeah, I, I mean, I want you to have a week to do them. So um, I, I, can, I could make them, I could make them available Wednesday morning. I, I only didn't do that because I knew we had lectures um, Wednesday afternoon at one and presumably students would be busy with um, doing some homework or doing the pre-class quiz. Uh, and I, I didn't want to stress you out by making, you know, yet another thing available, but you know, I, I easily can. I mean, if that stresses you out, you can simply look at it after the lecture when you have time. So I, I, I can remember to do that. Let, let me write that down. Okay, I'll do that uh, shortly after the lecture has ended. Um, sorry, but where can we find the lab manual? Um, I think Romina already answered that. Um, Grace said, thank you. Okay, so uh, unless I'm crazy, I think I've addressed um, all the questions that have come through. Um, does anyone else have any, have any questions before we call it a day? Will all, val wait, will all the values always be positive? Uh, what do you what do you mean by that, Rachel? Will all the values always be po values of of what? Capacitance and current. Uh, yes. Well, I mean, okay, that's a good point. Um, can you have a negative volume in a bucket? You know, you say that the bucket holds one liter of water. You can't say the bucket holds negative one liter of water. That, that doesn't make sense. Um, so yeah, it, it's inherently a positive value. Um, current, current is a little bit more technical um, because current is like a vector, right? It's flowing, it's movement, and movement is both a magnitude and a direction. So I don't want to say current is, is never negative. Mathematically, it can be negative, but Physically, what a negative current means physically is just a current traveling in the opposite direction that you assumed it was going in. So if I say, oh, a current is 10 amps, I inherently am talking about a certain direction, you know, 10 amps um, traveling, you know, to the, to the right in the wire. But if I measure that and it turns out to be negative 10 amps, it, it's not that there, there exists a negative current. It just means it's traveling in the opposite direction to what I assumed it was going in. So I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, let me know and I'll, yeah, okay, thank you, perfect. Okay, is there anything else before we let you go? Okay, it doesn't look like it. Um, so awesome, thanks for sticking around. Um, have a good hump day, it's Wednesday, so we're halfway through the week. Um, hopefully you have some time do some practice questions uh, and start the lab. And, and as was asked earlier, I will, I will make the labs available uh, earlier on on Wednesday. So you should be able to access it um, shortly after this video ends. Um, I will see everyone tomorrow and we will move on to new material, but we will do some examples of, of this stuff as, as a refresher. Okay, uh, ciao everyone. Thanks for coming out.